We're now going to begin Unit 3. Now, with Unit 3, I'm going to be adding some extra lessons because our book is just kind of assuming that we remember everything when it comes to working with decimals and working with fractions. And there are a lot of things that sixth graders come to me and they just didn't get before. So I'm going to be hopefully filling in those gaps for you as we work through this week and then get into next week. So hopefully these should be pretty easy for you and reminders. Um, if you already know this information, then great, fantastic. They should be easy A's for you. And if you don't already know this or you've missed out on it or it seemed really complicated in the past couple of years, please just take your time and be willing to learn from me because I once again, I strive to make math as easy and repeatable as possible. As we get into lesson 3.1, then we see that we're simply going to divide multi-digit whole numbers. So we want to look at our objective lesson, right? So once again, the I can statement. It says, I can use the standard algorithm to, but then that's where we probably need to stop because the terminology of standard algorithm probably gets confusing. And so let's make that easier for us. Standard. It just means that it's a proven routine. It's it's been shown that it's going to be able to be used over and over and over again. An algorithm, well, that's just a big fancy word that means a math process or a math problem even. So when we're looking at it, we're saying I can use the standard algorithm, the proven math process to divide multiple digit numbers. Not difficult, right? So when we see a math problem such as this, and we read it, it says 25,740 divided by 12 is equal to something. That's a standard algorithm. That is a proven math process that we can follow and fill in the division box. So as we did in unit two, we're going to review quickly the parts of division because in this lesson we need to know it and probably on your test you'll need to know it. Once again, dividend, has the N sound to it. So that's always going to be the number that is inside our division box. Divisor has the O at the end because it is outside of the division box. The division box is telling me what I am dividing by and I divide by my divisor, which is on the outside. My quotient is simply my answer. Now, when we first started getting into some division, we looked at the idea in unit one about the things that we have and then the groups. And our first number was what we have, sometimes in the number sentence like this is, or in a word problem. And then knowing what groups I'm dividing it by, that's gonna be my divisor on the outside. When it is an equation, an equation is a math problem with an equal sign to it, so we know we have an answer or something indicating the answer. And that also makes it easier because it's always the first number. Notice nowhere in there did I say, oh, we need the bigger number inside. It's not the case because that's how we get decimal numbers. So I just want the first number to go inside and divide by the second. Once again, that is an equation because it has an equal sign. Notice how equation starts with the same root as equal. So then we look at labeling our book. So please fill in the information inside of your book identifying these three different parts of division. Because once again, you need to know these. The dividend is on the inside, where the divisor is on the outside. And therefore, your answer is your quotient. So please make sure you have those filled in, and then let's look at doing our math. So when I have 25,740 divided by 12, I put my first number inside the box, it's what I have, and I'm putting it in equal groups, my divisor is 12. So then I start asking my questions. I look at my divisor and I'm gonna ask how many times will it go into the number that I'm looking at in the dividend? Will 12 go into two? I need to ask myself that. And that answer is no, it won't. And if it won't, then I go to my next number. So now I have a 25. Will 12 go into 25? Yes, it sure will. So that's one of those, if you don't know how many times, which I think you probably do, then I type in, once again, the number inside the box by the number on the outside in my calculator. So in my calculator, I need to enter in 25 divided by 12. Once I do that and I hit enter, then I see that I get two point stuff. And once again, we don't care about the stuff. 
but we care about the two because that's what we need to use. So I'm going to put the two. Now notice where the two goes because on some previous assignments, there have been a handful of you that have been messing up your work because you're not lining your stuff up correctly. I didn't put the two above the two because we said 12 will not go into two. So it has to go above the five and everything needs to be lined up neatly so I know exactly where my digits go while I'm dividing. My next step then, I always show a multiplication sign because what I'm actually doing is saying that two times 12 is gonna be equal to 24. And when I have that, then I subtract those and I get my remainder. Notice how everything is lined up nice and neat. Now I'm ready to bring down my next number. So I ask myself, will 12 go into 17? Yes, it will. How many times? Once again, we're gonna line everything up nice and neat. Since I just used the seven, when I ask my question, will 12 go into 17, then I know my answer of one has to go right above the seven. Then I multiply one times 12 is 12, and I get a remainder when I subtract those of five. Now I'm ready to bring down my next number. Guess where my answer is gonna go when I ask how many times will 12 go into 54? Well, 12 will go into 54 four times and it has to go above the four because the four is what I brought down. And when I look at what that equals, I can use my handy dandy calculator if I need to, four times 12 is 48. Now I subtract. Some of you want to put down four and you can't do that because you can't flip those. The number on top, the blue four, if you want to use your fingers, you can think, okay, well, if I'm holding four fingers, I can't take eight fingers from that, so I have to borrow. So from the five, it becomes a four, I carry over one, and now I have 14. You'd be kind of weird if you had 14 fingers, but now you can take eight from the 14, and 14 minus eight does give me six. I still have another digit to bring down, so I bring down my zero. Notice how my answers are lining up with each of the numbers from the dividend. How many times will 12 go into 60? Well, you can type it into your handy dandy calculator, 60 divided by 12 equals, and you will get five. And then five times 12 is 60, so now you have a zero remainder. So all we did when it comes to calculating, we find what the answer is, and the answer is 2,145. And then we simply circle it on our assignment. On this check, once again, same process. So we're gonna take the First number, that's going to be our dividend. It's going to go inside the box. I have 52,428. And now my second number goes on the outside because that's the groupings I'm going to put it into. I want to divide by 34. And I ask myself, will 34 go into 5? Nope, it won't. So will 34 go into 52? Yes, it will. So once again, that 1 has to go above the 2. And I have to make sure everything is lined up nice and neat so that when I'm continuing on in my math, I don't get confused where my numbers go. So now I show that multiplication, one times 34 is 34, and I subtract them. Once again, that top number, that two, I have two fingers, I can't take four fingers from it, so I have to borrow. Five becomes four, two becomes 12. Now, once again, you'd look weird if you had 12 fingers, but if you have 12, you can't take four from it, and 12 minus four is eight. Don't forget the four and the three. So we're used to just canceling out that first, that tens column, and we have one left over. So I do have to show that four minus three is equal to one. Now I bring down my four. I have 184. You can type that into your handy dandy calculator, 184 divided by 34, and you should see that you get five and stuff because five times 34 is 170. Then I can subtract. I can take zero from four, it's just four. And when I take seven from eight, I get one. So I have 14 left over. I know that I've done it right. I haven't mentioned this before, but when I look at what I have left over, when I look at my remainder, in this case, 14, I just simply ask, will 34 go into 14? That's just a quick mental check. That answer is no, so I know that I'm on track. If I end up with something other than that, let's say I put four up above, and I end up with this wonky number that's bigger than 34, right? Then I should say, well, I didn't go in enough. All right, so now I'm gonna bring down my two. And now I have 142 divided by 34. 
I type it into my handy dandy calculator and I see I get four and stuff because four times 34 is 136. Once again, I'm gonna have to borrow because I can't hold up two fingers and take six from it. So from the four, it becomes a three, the two becomes a 12. 12 minus six is six. I don't have anything else to subtract. So my last step, I'm gonna bring down my eight. Will 34 go into 68? Sure will, it'll go into even times because two times 34 is 68. So I have a zero remainder. That gives me an answer of 1,542. Not a difficult lesson so far, right? Hopefully it's pretty easy. Now we need to look at the type of problems where we're used to just wanting to write down a remainder. But that's not gonna happen very often in sixth grade, right? There are some specific type of questions that we'll use where we need a remainder, but other times we don't. So let, let's put this in a scenario, okay? Let's say we have 820 students and we have buses that can carry 25 students per bus. And we need to know, well, how many buses do we need to get all of the students transferred from one location to the next? And as we're dividing, we find out we need 32 buses that will be filled up with 25 students each. But then I have 20 students left over. So then, when I look at what I have left over, I start asking, well, what am I going to do? Do you want to be one of those 20 students left behind and not be allowed to go? No. Well, how many more things do I need then? And in this case, how many more buses do I need? And that's where we're like, okay, well, if I have 20 extra students, I still need one more bus. If I had one extra student, well, I don't want to be that one student left behind. So we need one more extra bus. So in those type of situations, it's okay to have remainder because we don't want to stick with 32. We want to say, all right, bus drivers, we need 33 buses to get all of our students to where we need to go. In sixth grade, though, we're going to do what's called annexing the zeros. And we've looked at several examples of this already. When we get a remainder, we don't want to stop. We want to add a decimal at the end of our whole number. We want to raise it up and then we want to put in a zero. And there are times where we have to put in a zero and put in a zero and put in a zero and put, you know, it might take us a while to get to the final end. But each time I put in a zero, I bring it down and then that allows me to divide. All right, so when we look at that type of situation, we have 5,272. Once again, the first number in an equation goes inside the box, it's my dividend. I want to divide by my second number, that's my divisor, and that is 64. And I still go through the same processes. Will 64 go into 5? No. Will 64 go into 52? No. Will 64 go into 527? Yes. So hopefully, when you get ready to write down your answer, you know where your answer has to go. Since I use the 5, the 2, and the 7, when I do my division and I find my answer, it has to go above the seven. So the last number that I used is where that answer to that short division is going to go. So in my handy dandy calculator, I can type in 527 divided by 64, and I'm gonna see I get eight and stuff. I need to keep the eight because eight times 64 is 512. So when I subtract those, I'm going to get a five, and then when I have two and one, I'm gonna get a one, and the fives cancel out. So I just have 15. 15 is smaller than 64, so I know I'm good to go. Now I'm gonna bring down my two. Now I have 152. I go to my handy dandy calculator. I type in 152 divided by 64, and I hit my equal sign, and I get two and stuff. Well, two times 64 is 128, and I can't take eight from two, so I know I have to borrow. Five becomes four. 12, and then I can subtract, and 12 minus 8 is 4, and 4 minus 2 is 224. This is not where I put 0.24. There are some of you that you put 0.24. That's not it, right? So annexing zeros means I have to add one. So if you think about annexing and adding, I'm going to put in a decimal at the end of my whole number, at the end of my dividend. And then I'm gonna raise it straight up so I know exactly where it goes. 
Once that happens, that allows me to add a zero to the end of my number. Now I may have to add two, three, four, five different zeros as I'm dividing until I don't have a remainder left. When I add that zero at the end, then it allows me to drop it and put it behind my number. And then I can divide 240 by 64 and see how many times 64 will go into it. Well, when I do that on my handy dandy calculator, I get three and stuff. And I find out that three times 64 is 192. Now I have to subtract again. Now I have a zero on top and I still can't take two fingers from it, so I have to borrow. And from the four, it becomes a three and the zero becomes a 10. Now I can subtract 10 minus two is gonna give me eight. But now I have three minus nine and I can't take nine from three fingers. So I have to borrow from the front number, from the hundreds. And that's gonna give me 13, which will allow me to have 13. And I take nine away to give me four. Huh, 48. 64, it's still smaller than 64, so I have to add another zero and bring it down. Now I have to divide 480 by 64 on my handy dandy calculator, and I see that I get seven and stuff. Huh, again. All right, so multiply seven times 64, and I get 448. Now I have to borrow so I can subtract. Eight becomes seven, the zero becomes 10, and 10 minus eight is two. 7 minus 4 is 3, right? It's still not a zero balance. We have to persevere. We have to continue to go until we get to the end. Is it going to be a lot of work to show your steps here? Sure it is. Is that okay? Absolutely, because the harder you work, the better you are. So I'm going to add another zero. I'm going to bring it down. I'm going to persevere until I am truly successful and I get to a zero remainder. Will 64 go into 320? Yes. How many times? Five times. And when I type that into my handy dandy calculator, I find out that's 320. I have a zero remainder. That's the goal I have to get to. So when I have 5,272 and I'm dividing it by 64, what I get is 82 and 375 thousandths. Could I have to go out further? Well, yeah, there are numbers you might have to. This is not math that you are unable to do, right? You just have to follow the steps and repeat the steps until you get to a final answer. Once again, the final answer is 82.375. And then we circle our final answer so we can indicate where it is. All right, so what about 16,047 divided by 60? First number in an equation in a number sentence goes inside the box. It's my dividend. Second number is the divisor. It's on the outside, and I need to find my quotient. So I go through the same steps every time. Will 60 go into 1? No. Will 60 go into 16? No. But 60 will go into 160. So I know that the answer that I find when I type it into my handy-dandy calculator has to go above the zero. So when I type in 160 divided by 60, then I get a two because two times 60 is 120. Do I have a remainder? Yeah, I do. It's okay, I have numbers to bring down. So I'm gonna bring down the four. Now I take 404 divided by 60 and I get a six and stuff. Well, once again, I ignore the stuff and I know that I can use my calculator so I can do 60 times six and that's gonna give me 360. Then I can subtract. Well, I have four and I can take zero from it because that's just four, but I have zero on the top and I can't take six from it. So then I have to borrow from the hundreds. The four becomes a three and the zero becomes a 10 and 10 minus six is four. All right, well, 44 is smaller than 60. So I know I'm in a good track on solving it, but now I gotta bring down my seven. I take 447 divided by 60 and I'm going to get in my handy dandy calculator a seven because seven times 60 is 420. I had stuff after my seven. I don't care about it. I ignore it. I have to get to a zero remainder. Now I'm going to subtract seven minus zero is seven and four minus two is two. That's smaller than 60, but now I have nothing else there. So we're going to annex. We're going to add that decimal. We're gonna bring the decimal straight up. Notice how everything is lining up nice and neat so I can keep track of where I am. I'm gonna add a zero behind the decimal and bring it down. 
Now I have 270 divided by 60. Well, 270 divided by 60 is going to go in four times because four times 60 is 240. I know I have four in stuff, but I don't care once again about the stuff. I keep the whole number. I have the four, and now I'm going to subtract. Excuse me, subtract. Zero minus zero is zero. Seven minus four is three. Hmm. Smaller than 60, so I need to add a zero at the end and bring it down. Will 60 go into 300? Sure will. Typing it into my handy dandy calculator, 300 divided by 60, and I get a whole number. Makes it easier, right? So I get five because five times 60 is 300. I have a zero remainder. So my final answer is 267 and 45 hundredths. And then I circle it. Is it a lot of work to show? Yes. Is it difficult work to show? No. All right. I'm not asking you to, you know, solve <clears throat> some strange and crazy 14 step algorithm. I'm just asking you to simply divide until you get a zero remainder. All of which you can do, you just have to follow the proper steps. All right, so when we look at this quotient, once again, first number can go inside the box, and I'm going to divide by 15. When I have my divisor of 15 and I start with my first number, will 15 go into 5? No. Will 15 go into 52? Yes. When I type it in, I get my answer with a decimal, where do I have to write the answer? Hopefully you said above the two, because when I take 52 divided by 15, I get three and stuff. I keep the three, three goes above the two, three times 15 is 45. I have to borrow, because once again, I can't take five from two fingers. So in my first five at the top, I'm gonna borrow and it's gonna become a four. Carry over the 10 and that becomes 12. Now I can subtract. 12 minus 5 is 7, and then 4 minus 4, that's nothing, so I'm good to go. I bring down my 0. Will 15 go into 70? It will. Will it go in it evenly? No, I get 4 and stuff, right? 70 divided by 15 equals 4 and stuff. I keep the 4. I ignore the stuff because I don't care about it. 4 times 15 then is 60. When I subtract those, I get a remainder of 10. I bring down my eight, sorry, those animations were in the wrong order. And now I'm going to divide 108 by 15. When I type that into my handy dandy calculator, I get seven because seven times 15 is 105. So now I subtract and well, that's a small remainder, I have a three, and I bring down my zero. Will 15 go into 30? It will, twice, and there's no remainder. So what happened to the decimal? Well, not every question on our assignment is going to be a decimal answer. So it could be a decimal if you have to continue to divide, or it could be a whole number like 3,472. Notice the process is the same. The steps are the same. Notice I'm showing arrows. I'm crossing out. I'm borrowing. I'm showing all my work step by step so I know exactly what I'm doing mathematically. What about this one? Notice that's 8,890 divided by 40. So my first number, once again, is what I have. It goes inside my division box. It's my dividend. 8,890 is divided by 40. My second number, my divisor, it goes on the outside. And I ask, will 40 go into 8? No. Will 40 go into 88? Yes. How many times? It's going to go in two times because 2 times 40 is 80. Notice we put that two above the second eight. When I subtract, I have a remainder of eight. So now I'm gonna bring down my nine. Well, that one's pretty easy. We know that 40 went into 88 twice, so it's gonna go into 89 twice because two times 40 once again is 80, and now I have a nine and I bring down my zero. Hmm, that's still pretty close to the 80, so we're gonna say two again, and two times 40 is 80. And now I have a remainder of 10. Now what? Add a decimal, right? Bring it up. Add a zero. Bring it down. Will 40 go into 100? It will. How many times? Still two. Two times 40 is still 80. I get a remainder of, well, that one's a little different, right? I have to borrow from that one in the front. Now I have 10 minus 8 and 2. So I still have to add a zero and bring it down. And now I have 40 goes into 200. 
Is it going to be 2 again? No, it's too big. So 20 divided by 4 is the same as 200 divided by 40. 20 divided by 4 is 5. So therefore, 200 divided by 40 is 5. And I now don't have a remainder. So we see that our, I don't know why I have that answer there. The answer is up above the division box. It should be 222.25. Ignore the other answer up there. I forgot to change it. All right, so when we look at this one, we have 5,777 divided by 160. Now we have a three-digit number to divide by. Now what do I do? I do the exact same math. It's okay. As long as I do the same math, I'm still going to get the right answer. Will 160 go into 5? No. Will 160 go into 57? No. Will 160 go into 577? Yes. How many times? Well, when I type it into my calculator, I get 577 divided by 160. I get 3 and stuff because 3 times 160 is 480. Then I can subtract. 7 minus nothing is 7. And I can't take 8 from 7, so we have to borrow. 5 becomes 4, and I have 17. And 17 minus 8 is 9. So now I bring down my 7. I type in 977 divided by 160. And I see that I get 6 and stuff. So I keep my 6. Because 6 times 160 is 960. When I subtract, then I have a remainder of 7. A remainder of 1. I have 17. There's nothing else to bring down. So I have to add stuff to bring down. I add my decimal. I raise it straight up. I add a 0. I bring it straight down. 160 will go into 170 just one time. Because it's pretty close. All right, so when I subtract those, I get a remainder of 10. Now I add a zero and bring it down. How many times will 160 go into 100? It won't. So do I add another zero and bring it down? No, because if I bring something down, I have to put something up, right? We've made that note several different times. So make sure that I hold that place value. 160 goes into 100 zero times. I have to hold it. Then I can add another zero and bring it down. 1,000 now divided by 160 is going to be, I left off my number, it looks like, I apologize. It's going to be 6 because 6 times 160 is 960. I went ahead and did the subtraction. So when we subtract, we get a remainder of 40. That's still not a zero, so I have to add another zero and bring it down. Right. Now, I told you we can get into decimal numbers where we have five, six, seven, eight different decimal positions. How do I know when to stop when I don't have a remainder? So 400 divided by 160, that's going to be 2 because 2 times 160 is 320. All right. So now when I subtract, I have to borrow. I have a 10. Well, 0 and 0 is 0. 10 minus 2 is 8, and 3s cancel out. Add another zero and bring it down. 160 will go into 800 how many times? Well, when you type that into your handy dandy calculator, you find a five. And do you have stuff after it? No, you do not, because five times 160 is 800. So we had to put in five decimal positions there to get to our answer. So 36 and 10,625, 10 millionths is our answer. A lot of work? Yes. Difficult work? No. As long as you are neat and organized, then you won't have any problems doing these questions. All right. So your assignment is in the handout. Please get it from me. It is due tomorrow. Hopefully, if you uh, do have any questions, then you'll come and ask your teacher.